Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Ultimate Persona Compendium. I did a video many years ago now, looking at all the lost Java-based Persona games released on phones back in the 2000s and early 2010s. For many of these games, the footage and screenshots in this video are pretty much all we have. They're not easily accessible, unless you happen to have a Japanese feature phone from the 2000s that had them downloaded. This pretty much makes them lost to the vast majority of us. More recently though, some of these games have started to be re-released on Steam and the Nintendo Switch as part of the Gmode Archives Plus series. Games released as part of this project includes The Last Bible Games, Majin Tensei Blind Thinker, and the subject of this video, Megami in Bunroku Persona, Iku no Tohen, also known as Anomalous Tower Chronicle. Yes, after many years, we can actually play this lost side story to my beloved Persona 1. It was not given any official English language support, but fear not, because a fan translation exists for the PC version. Just install the game through Steam, place the patcher in a directory like so, and then patch it. The localization is mostly based on the PSP version. The patch fixes some stuff like this strange misspelling of Priestess, and even some bugs. And yes, it does retain Mark Danced Crazy. The Gmode Archives ports faithfully preserves these games while also giving them a nice modern presentation. You're able to play it with a phone border for extra authenticity. Or you can play it in full screen with sharp pixels, which is mostly what you're going to be seeing throughout this video. In the borders, you'll notice these additional button prompts that are not in the game itself. It's a nice touch that lends this port a comfortable console experience, which I imagine is a step up from how it was originally presented. I do find it rather ironic that this obscure phone game has such a nice modern port, and yet the actual Persona 1 has yet to receive such treatment. If you're watching this in the future, and there actually is a nice modern port of Persona 1, you don't need to tell me in the comments. I'm probably already playing it. Like most of the Atlas phone games from this era, it was developed by BBMF, and released in 2006. A decade after the original game, but before the PSP version. So the interface and some of the music is based on the PSX version. As I mentioned, it's an untold side story that takes place after the party is transported by the Davis system in the Seebeck building, but before they arrive in Maki's ideal world. The entire game would therefore take place right around here. They find themselves sent to a parallel dimension with a giant tower filled with demons. The party is separated, leaving us only the protagonist, Maki and Mark at the start of the game. Igor informs them that in order to find their missing friends and escape, they must collect nine magical orbs and reach the tower's summit. Along the way, they meet a mysterious little girl named Maria, who I'm fairly sure is a sprite editor of Alice. Her presence is indeed highly suspicious. She's not even the first suspicious little girl they've run across in this story, but they're more than happy to bring her along as they try to escape the anomalous tower. The orbs they need to find are being guarded by demons that act as boss fights every ten floors of the tower. At least in the first half of the game anyway, as we'll get to. It's a dungeon crawler reminiscent of the first Persona game with very similar gameplay mechanics, but it has its own spin to keep things interesting. The floors are randomly generated upon entering, much like Persona 3's Tartarus, which came out the same year as this, coincidentally enough. Yeah, this is kind of Persona 1 by way of Persona 3. And just like that game, you can have good luck and find the stairs to the next floor almost immediately, or have bad luck and have to explore every last nook and cranny looking for the path forward. The latter happened far more often than not for me, to a point where I started to wonder if the game was cheating and only generating the stairs after a certain amount of rooms had already been explored. This is probably not the case though, and I'm just extremely unlucky. Still, there's no greater feeling in these types of games than having good stair luck and finding them sooner than you'd expect. According to some online guides, these stairs have a higher chance of spawning on the north side of the map. Is this true? We may as well do a little experiment to find out. Oh, 
That was quite damning, wasn't it? It seems that a good rule of thumb is to always check the north side of the dungeon first. I wish I knew this while I was actually playing the game. The anomalous tower forces you to make some difficult decisions since you're only able to save your progress at rest areas. The more time you spend climbing the tower, the more you could potentially lose if you die while exploring. You may be tempted to use an escape doll rather than pressing on further into dangerous territory and risk losing progress. And when I say progress, I don't mean you'll be reverted back to your last save point like in the original Persona 1. This game uses a quasi-roguelike approach where getting party wiped means losing any items, equipment and money you have on hand. However, you still get to keep your experience points, spell cards, personas and persona ranks. At the very least, your grinding is not in vain. In the early game, it might be a good idea to just reload your last save point anyway, since equipment and resources are hard to come by at this point. Later on though, the massive floors and long hours between rest areas makes this less than ideal. To put it into perspective, the final stretch of the tower is a 20 floor gauntlet that can take upwards of 5 hours to finish. It's quite a long time to go without a proper save point. There's suspended saves of course, it's still a phone game at the end of the day. But you better hope the power doesn't cut out at any point. It makes for a surprisingly tense dungeon crawling experience that feels closer to the Snow Queen quest difficulty rather than the more casual Seabet group. Death means being booted back to the entrance of the tower, where you can retry from any of the rest areas you have unlocked. Equipment and money can be deposited into the warehouse for safekeeping. This will remain here even if you die, so it's a good idea to fill it with any old and unused equipment that you have lying around in case you lose your current stuff. This area is the only place where you can change your party members, which can be slightly annoying since there's no velvet room to offload any of their equipped personas. The velvet room can only be found in the rest areas. So if you find a new party member and want to change anyone's persona, you must first use an escape doll to go back to the entrance, then go back into the tower for the velvet room, then go into the dungeon and then use an escape doll. The protagonist is mandatory, but you can freely use any four of the original game's cast allowing you to create combinations that were previously impossible on any route, such as Yukino and Reiji. Unfortunately, they all start with low levels, forcing you to do a bit of grinding to bring them up to speed with the other characters. I'd say it's definitely worth investing the time to use Reiji since his initial persona resists everything, and he's the best overall physical attacker, something that becomes very valuable in the late game when magic becomes less viable, as we'll get to later. You'll notice that the battle grid here is much smaller than it is in the PSX game. It only has 9 squares instead of 25, giving it a bit more of a compact feel. Party members become available when you find them lost around the tower. Nanjo is found on the 3rd floor. Ellie is on the 12th. Brown is on the 13th. Ayase on the 22nd. And Yukino is on the 27th, somehow. I don't even know what she's doing here, considering she stays back at the school during much of the Seabeck route. Maybe this story is actually following on from the alternate version of the Seabeck route implied by the Snow Queen quest's ending, where she actually does seem to join up with the others. Finally, you find Reiji on the 52nd floor. It goes without saying that the sound and presentation isn't quite on the same level as the PSX version. There are many missing animations and sprites to make it work on a flip phone from 2006. You don't see the characters wielding any guns or swords. Sound effects are rudimentary. In spite of this, the gameplay still manages to retain some of the satisfying crunch of the original battle system. Most of the assets here originate from Persona 1, but there are some things lifted from Persona 2 as well, such as the character portraits. Igor is the most obvious one since it's a different portrait entirely, but all of your party members also use their slightly altered Persona 2 incarnations as well, even the ones that never had them to begin with. Wait, what? They're ever so slightly different, just enough to give me Uncanny Valley vibes. Maggie's in particular is quite strange. It's not quite her original portrait, but it's not quite her Persona 2 portrait either. How can we even be sure that this is the real Marquis? I mean, the real fake Marquis. You get a grand total of four songs in the entire game. The dungeon crawling music. The 
the rest area music. The normal battle theme. And the final boss theme. You'll hear the first three of those within five minutes of playing, so I was pleasantly surprised to hear something new after close to 30 hours of playtime, even if it was just a lower quality version of the Queen of the Night boss music. I regret to inform you that this game has no version of Ari of the Soul. At any rate, we may as well go through the rest of the plot, what little of it there is, anyway. There are short dialogues when you reunite with party members and when you encounter boss enemies that possess an orb. All of these, aside from the final one, are regular enemies repurposed as boss fights. The first is the demon chef Nizrok on the 10th floor. It's before you have a full party at your disposal, so it can be quite challenging, especially since he casts devastating darkness magic that can very easily wipe your party. This boss is a puzzle with a correct solution, though. The silver prayer wheels that are dropped from enemies on the previous floors will nullify darkness and expel magic altogether. They're a useful resource for the entirety of the game. Nizrok can't do much of anything once it's used, allowing the party to snag the second of the nine orbs. The second boss is Hauka, who makes mention of someone, or something, called the Destroyer. Just a little bit of foreshadowing for the end of the game. There's not much to say about this one. It's an incredibly easy battle, since Hauka just tends to use buffs and ailments. The next boss, however, is a bit more troublesome. The Black Widow does not have any enemies flanking her, but she's not to be underestimated. Her eternal black spell hits you with heavy curse damage, and it's too early in the game for you to have an adequate source of healing to counteract it. It may be a good idea to position your party in the shape of an X, since this is the only formation that isolates Area of Effect magic to only one character at a time. Nanjo's initial persona is able to absorb Curse, but even he isn't safe from her physical attacks. It was extremely clutch, but I managed to beat this boss with only Ellie left standing. Her fire nullification came in extremely handy here. She's truly the MVP. Yeah! Oh my god! Oh my god! Most of the mechanics function as you'd expect, but there are some notable changes from the original game. Experience points are now distributed evenly across all of your characters, like most other turn-based RPGs. You no longer have to worry about certain characters lagging behind because they're unable to pull their weight in battle. A character's level and their persona level are still two separate things, but now it's mostly for show as the Persona level will always be higher than the Character level. These values are fixed, and is no longer based on whether you used your Persona's magic more than physical attacks. You're now able to allocate the stats of your party members when they level up, instead of just the protagonist. The next boss of the tower guards the Floor 40 rest area. It's a divine power accompanied with a Tofei Vanguard. He's weak to physical attacks, so getting rid of his flying entourage as soon as possible should be top priority. Strangely, the next two rest areas on floor 50 and 60 are not guarded by any tough demons. The next boss fight doesn't come until floor 70 with Fatala, and he's a bit of a pushover. By this point, your party members probably have some high-level personas with heavy-hitting magic. It's incredibly easy to become overpowered early on in the game if you use the Velvet Room during a full moon and throw an item into the fusion. There's a small chance of Personas gaining a powerful spell in their second skill slot. The Velvet Room here functions pretty much the same as it does in the original game. All the same mechanics are at play, including the creation of full Personas through fusion accidents. The next battle is encountered on the 91st floor with Paimon, Ouroboros, and Ganesha. They possess the final three orbs the party needs to collect to leave the tower. Even though all three of them are boss demons with a large HP pool, they don't pose much of a threat against an endgame party. Ma Aiha could be a problem depending on your persona loadout, but again, this can be completely nullified with a silver prayer wheel. Ganesha likes to use Megarudine but by this point you should have a good healing spell like Mediorama to counteract it. 
There's no rest area after this boss, so you must choose to either turn back for now or press on into the uppermost floors of the tower, where the most dangerous enemies await. Many of them resist magic, so physical attacks, and guns especially, become key to survival. The Miyasu Dokoro enemies are extremely dangerous because of their crystal wall barriers. If they're accompanied by other demons, your best bet is to try escaping the battle while you still can. Another annoying enemy are the Little Grey Men. They come in large numbers and are able to stun you with Mazeodyne, which will draw out the battle and give them more chances to kill you with Hell Eyes. The best strategy is to shoot them with bullets that cause ailments, like the charm bullets that you can get from the floor 80 rest area. At this point in the dungeon, the floors become extremely huge and expansive, and to make matters worse, some of the chests have traps in them that reset your map. Towards the end, I stopped opening chests altogether to avoid this. It's extremely punishing. Once you get to floor 99, your party members will have something to say. It's finally time to take on the final battle. The orbs summon everyone to the top of the tower, but a mysterious force stops him from leaving. The little girl Maria reveals that she used the party to carry the orbs to the top so that she could escape to the human world and wreak havoc. She's actually a powerful demon known as the Destroyer, a form that she'll transform into after her first phase is dealt with. This right here might be the only original sprite in the entire game, and it is rather glorious. If you thought this phone game wasn't going to have a final boss with 30k HP, think again. She'll frequently cast Makarakan, so it's a good idea to have over 80 agility on your party members so they can act first. You'll notice in the footage that I didn't have that and suffered the consequences. This is another good place to use a silver prayer wheel to nullify Ma Aiha. You still have to worry about Dark Verdict, Ailments, and Megidolian, though. Unless you're very overleveled, it's a long fight that can take around half an hour to beat. Or you can win it immediately by using a Repulse Bell. Yes, really. You don't get any XP for doing it this way, though. Once the Destroyer is defeated, the party escapes and the plot resumes from the original game. No, we're not given an explanation for why the characters never mention this little adventure ever again. There's really not much to speak of in terms of plot, as you'd expect from a phone game. The Destroyer's true nature is never really elaborated on. It's just some kind of demon that wanted to cause chaos for fun. It doesn't seem to be based on any existing beings in mythology either, so we can't even begin to speculate. But the story isn't really the point of this game, now is it? It is, at its core, a pure gameplay-oriented dungeon crawler. After you defeat the final boss, you're given the option to save the game. This isn't New Game Plus, but it does allow you to resume from the floor 80 rest area with all of the stuff you collected before the ending, just in case you wanted to go back and grind in the end game some more. You can refight the final boss as many times as you like. There are many secret personas that are only fusible with totems, just like in the original. But since there's no casino or fixed item drops in this game, they can only be found by revisiting certain floors and getting lucky with the RNG. This is also how you're able to find rare equipment that isn't for sale in the shop. Most of the time though, what you'll find are gems, and these can be used in the refinery to improve the stats of your weapons and equipment. Pretty much every piece of equipment you find can be leveled up in this way. Some unique items can only be found by returning a Persona when it reaches its max rank, which feels a lot grindier to do this time around. Almost none of my initial Personas were max rank, even after extensive grinding. It felt like it took forever for Seimon Kongo to finally unlock Magaru, and by that point I was already long past the need for it. Anomalous Tower Chronicle is nothing too amazing, but it is rather enjoyable for what it is. I'd say it's worth playing if you like Persona 1 and have a taste for old school dungeon crawlers. They don't really make them like this anymore. Well, Atlas doesn't anyway. It is 99 floors of grindy battles though, and the game doesn't give you much in terms of musical variety. I'm sure the repetition was less of an issue if you played this here and there while out and about, but as a console game, it's probably best enjoyed while listening to a podcast or something. Hopefully more of these games are re-released by Gmode, and even more English fan translations become available. 
it will be nice to see the Persona 2 phone games get ported next. Or even Igus the first mission. Hold up. <laughs> While I was editing this, Igus first mission was actually announced during the Gmode Archive's 4th anniversary stream. I think we can safely say that this is the most important thing related to Persona 3 in 2024. A special thank you to my channel members and patrons. I've been Snickety Slice, I'll see you around.